to Carl's perspective. Well, she's not your mother, that's for sure, shrugs the golden-haired Terran with the young face. Even if she is an almost perfect 50% mass to your genome, and a near 100% mass to your mitochondrial and X-chromosomal DNA. Victor looks dismayed. Emiko frowns. Could you explain, Tice? How do you know she's not his mother if her genes line up with his like that? I'm obviously no expert, but what you've just said sounds like a positive paternity test to me. The geneticist nods. It certainly looks that way, until you look at any one of... What looks like a hundred or so pins fall into the chromosomal map. These locations... All of these are sequences where neither of her alleles match to either of his, and when you look at the same locations on his genome, every single one is the location of a subjectively less desirable allele that has been replaced on hers. If we look at this one, for instance... He selects one of the pins. On your genome, Mr. Taylor, you have a recessive allele that will put any children you had with someone who also possessed it at significantly increased risk of heart attacks. Hers lacks it, having two functional copies of the allele instead. Terrans are well known for the advanced nature of your genetic science and comparative readiness to correctively tamper with your own genes. How do you know she hasn't simply undergone gene therapy since she mothered Victor? I ask. Because the genetic machinery used for gene therapy leaves behind a completely different signature to this. This was done on a single set of her genes. So, stars Victor, horror spreading across his face. Kara Stellan is almost certainly an illegal clone of your mother, yes. From what you told us about how your mother died and what we know of the Revenkists, it seems likely that she was selected on the strength of her heroic death. Who knows how many other Bastionites are unwittingly cloned war heroes? Answers the gentlest Terran simply. Victor's breaths increase rapidly as he backs away, choking and swallowing chaotically as if losing control of his body. He turns and places his left fist on the wall, resting his head against it and closing his eyes. I start. Victor, I... Ah! He half growls, half screams, causing everyone else present to wince and tense as he levels a full-strength punch into the wall panel, causing it to buckle and dent. Silence reigns for several long moments. Then he straightens up and, without looking at any of us, says, I'm sorry about that. I'm going to my room. Please leave me alone for a bit. Tell everyone else to do the same, if you would. With that, he walks from the room, leaving us behind, still in silence. I've never seen him so upset as that. Kara's perspective. A clone? I ask, horrified. That's what I said, yes answers the Tashwani woman, soberly. I'm just some ursa's copy of a woman who died in the war, and everyone else at my orphanage just lied when they told me I was an orphan? She gives a mirthless smile as she answers. As a fellow clone, albeit of a much older woman and under very different circumstances, I wouldn't describe us as ersatz. As to whether you were lied to, I have no way of knowing who, if any of those that raised you, knew what you actually were. But someone will have. Clones don't get made by accident. Someone very intentionally made you and put you in that orphanage, knowing full well that you were no war orphan. I think I'm going to be sick, I say, bringing my hand to my mouth and fighting to keep my stomach contents down as waves of nausea rack my body. She shoots out her long leg and hooks an empty waist bin with her foot, dragging it close enough that she could reach it from her chair. She picks it up and places it between my cuffed hands. I grab the bin and stand to bring my face over it. 
Thankfully, my nausea passes without me losing my lunch. I'm probably not the only one, am I? I mutter desolately. It seems unlikely you would be, she confirms. How many other of Bastion's children are just the reincarnations of dead soldiers? Were any of us real? Why? Why would they do this? What do they have to gain from making a bunch of war orphans? I ask her, grimacing. I can't know that either, I'm afraid, but I have a fairly good guess. My brow furrows so hard it hurts, as I ask. What's your guess? Well, I would guess that they told themselves some very grand and noble-sounding stories about how they were honouring war heroes and giving them a second chance to live. But in reality, what they wanted was a large subsequent generation of young minds to mould into their ideal of what Terran should be. They wanted a supply of warm bodies to do their menial work for them. I understand that slavery is practised on Bastion, but exclusively against garden worlders who don't tend to make for good heavy labourers, so slaves tend to be used for other purposes. Her wide lips curl in disgust. Soldiers made for a good genetic sampling pool because anyone with debilitating genetic conditions was pre-excluded by the draft process. Catastrophic defeats made for good sampling locations because once the victorious army moved on, they would tend to be quite deserted for a while and... The dark skin of her broad, flat face twists apologetically. Telling you you were a war orphan seems like a good way to predispose you to hate garden worlders, doesn't it? So, I've just been livestock my whole life and never realised? She shrugs. That's certainly one way of looking at it, yes. My stomach heaves again and this time... I'm not able to overpower the urge to vomit. I grab the bucket and empty my guts into it, feeling the acid burn my throat and the back of my nose as I do. I collapse back into my chair and stare dully into the violet eyes across the table. So, Miss Tellen, do you feel like telling me now? Where is Bastion? I shake my head, panting, and I answer... I can't tell you that. She cocks an eyebrow and says, You mean you're still willing to defend them after what you've just learned? I shake my head again. I mean, I don't. <sighs> no. Transport, in and out, is something <sighs> taken care of by only <clears throat> a few ships... We've trusted crews. Clearly shocked, she asks. You mean that almost everyone on Bastion has no idea where it is? I nod. That's very interesting. More than I've managed to learn from any other Revan Kiss I've interviewed, she states, tapping a long finger against a smooth chin. So, what else can you tell me about it? Were Quark's perspective. I walk through the hallway on the topmost of the Death World dorms. Their smell hangs heavily on the air, though none are present. I reach the door at the far end and turn to face it. With a bracing inhale, I wave to alert the occupant of my presence. Heavy footfalls sound, and before the door is opened, I'm already hearing the tones of the Terran lingua franca. Translated as, Baby, I told you, I need to be alone to process. The door slides open, revealing a large, heavily built Terran, whose hairless, muscular body is almost entirely nude, bar a kind of loin covering with two leg holes. His hand clutches a half-empty bottle of amber liquid. The Terran is looking slightly up with a bloodshot pair of emerald eyes. He looks down and sways unnervingly as he frowns. This... You ain't soon. Confused, I answer. I never claim to be. What you doing here, bigger burb? He slurs, 
followed by a hysterical giggle. Heavily unnerved by the chaotic way this death ward is behaving, I answer. I came to thank you. For what? he demands, twisting his nose and mouth and raising an eyebrow, as if he has no idea what I'm talking about. For, well, you saved my life and the life of my- Yeah! I shriek and jump back as the meter-white head of a blue-furred, amber-eyed carnivore appears at his side. The man snickers at me. The beast makes no move to attack. I, uh, I, um, I'm sorry. Could you put that thing on the lead, perhaps? Lightning fast, he drops to his haunches in a way that brings our faces level, and, scowling wide-eyed, growls, This is where she lives. You came here. You don't like it? Put yourself on the lead and lead yourself the fuck away. Putting an arm around his shoulders, pulling his body against his and stroking the fur in his clavicle with his hand. He's close enough that I can smell the toxic quantity of ethanol vapor on his breath. I have something to say to you first, I assert. Go on then, he glares. I, it, you saved my life and my mate's life in the attack the other day. I came to thank you. He sneers. You already said that bit. Was there something else? Why is he making this so difficult? I suppose, just, thank you. All right, bye, he says, standing and turning to close the door. Wait, that's it? I demand incredulously. You aren't going to acknowledge my thanks? I'm trying to reconcile with you. Yeah? Well, what if I don't want to reconcile with you? Snarls the Death Welder. What if I have other shit on my mind right now? The massaging the ego of some petty, officious little Dolores Umbridge R segregationist who casually tosses words like miscegenator and machine at good people just so she can make herself feel better about what a massive pile of shit she is. You think of that? I'm dumbstruck by that for a long few moments while the angry, inebriated Terran stands, scowling down at me. Eventually, I manage... If that's all you think of me, why did you save my life? If you had waited another second to disarm that other Terran, you could have washed your hands of me. He scoffs. Ain't how it works. You think I can think things through like that? You think I'd do anything like that if I was thinking about it at all? You think I've got time to think, what are the advantages and disadvantages of saving this person or not? I saved you because you needed saving. I saved you because I don't get to decide how much your life is worth. I saved you because, even though i never seen you be anything other than a cunt to anyone, don't mean I get to say you deserve to die. Simple as. Despite the aggressive way he delivers it, I can't help but be impressed by the nobility of the statement. What? What's happened to reduce you to the state you're in right now, Mr. Taylor? I say calling the man by his name for the first time out loud. He snorts. Not that it's any of your fucking business, but if you must know, I just found out that I'm sharing a ship with a eugenic clone of my mum, made by bigoted terrorists who think about garden models the way you do about death worlders. After spending the last four days thinking she were alive, after a lifetime of thinking she were dead, how's your week going? After some moments of making sense of what happened to be word salad, at first, I answer, Certainly not as bad as that, Mr. Taylor. The Terran drops to the floor, in a way that definitely would have had me add a note about his alcoholism to my file, if I'd seen five days ago, and half swivels, half falls, with his back impacting the wall. His shoulders slumped, his long, thick, bare legs lying in front of him at a right angle to his torso. He turns his face upward and emits rapid puffing sounds. His eyes screw up and clear fluid begins spilling from them. Even though it looks very different, the pain he's feeling right now is one I know all too well. I wasn't even angry, 
there wasn't even a fucking moment where I was thinking, hey, mum, where the fuck you been all my life? I was so fucking happy just to finally have her back when she started saying she didn't know what I was talking about. I started rationalising. Maybe she got amnesia. Maybe they wiped her memories when they kidnapped her. Maybe she's in deep cover and I'm blowing it for her. But no. She didn't know my name, my dad's name, Auntie Tamsin's, Uncle Rex's, Uncle Rabbi's, Simone Sands or anyone else. Because that's not her. Just a cruel fucking joke. I look at the emotional male and imagine how his situation would feel. If I saw someone who seemed to be Korea, but who didn't know me, if I found out that this had been done to her, it would be devastating. I'm extremely so- Spare me, he snarls, startling me. I'm sure I've already given you more than enough dirt to add to your pathetic little burn book, so just fuck off. Despite his inebriation, his hand flies perfectly over his head to impact the panel. The door slides closed, lightly impacting the short snout of the predator as it shuts. It yowls in protest, and the drunkard immediately transforms his tone, allowing me to hear a sympathetic, Oh, sorry, baby. I didn't mean to. Didn't see you there. Come here. Through the door. <laughs> 